Good afternoon, everyone. So today uh, we're going to have a TTT by Martin about query execution in MongoDB. Uh, Martin, feel free to start whenever you want. Well, thank you. You really teased me because it turns to be this meeting is becoming a Schrodinger meeting. And so I thought that's a good excuse for me. But of course, the Schrodinger meeting actually is for, uh, for Stephen for next week. Whether or not we will have the presentation <laughs> or not. So I thought that's not going to save me after your arm twisting last week. To the so I said the next really way I could chicken out of this presentation is bribery. <laughs> so oh, I am Brazilian. I actually go to pass the bribes around. <laughs> so to make sure. <laughs> uh, so please attack. <laughs> yeah, I think Martin is a great candidate for it. <laughs> you shouldn't have elected a Brazilian for the <laughs> TTT. <laughs> For the newcomers, this is the famous Boutini uh, chocolate from Amsterdam. But of course, I cannot bribe you with actually gifts, which is not mine. Yes, I go on, you don't have No, 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 so, of course, I cannot bribe you with something which is not mine, because this is the yearly compliment of uh, the MonetDB. For all the contributions you have given this year to the progress and the improvement of MonetDB. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe the last year. <laughs> so, uh, it's about uh, three years with MonetDB. You really squeeze me, because that's, of course, the... Uh, I haven't pre did not prepare any talks, so after you squeezed me, I had to find an experiment, run experiments, and try to give you at least a few little lessons of this old guy. So let's start with actually this one. Um, this is uh, MonetDB running in uh, various instances, uh, starting with the July 2017 up to like, the current situation that's running on one of the simple workstations we have on the other side, an i7 core core that is a bit of memory. And as you may notice that at least the code is not standing still at all. It's actually improving actually with big strides as you go along. Now where are you coming from? A plethora of issues. Most importantly, changing in the way we do the algorithms, changing the way we deal with candidates, the materialization, is, is being dealt here. Rewriting actually the query optimizer in, in, in various, uh, various ways. So we see a continuous actually decline. Is this the end? No, absolutely not. I know already by uh, uh, looking at the details of where the performance is being spent. My current estimate is the next target is around 180 seconds on scale factor 100. And it has to do with finalizing candidate list propagation into, for example, arithmetic, arithmetic expressions. So we don't have to materialize there either. Running primitives against compressed data, which is not yet in there, it will come in the next release. So this is not the bottom line. So this is where we are. Well, how does it compare with your other favorite systems? Of course, I didn't try it out DuckDB <laughs> because I don't think that's fair, yeah? Well, I could do, but then of course the first number would be around one minute, but this is better. Um, so let's look at something actually others have done here in, in the group a couple of years ago and take, let's say, an eight times more powerful machine, a 32 core machine, SSDs, enough memory, and that's luckily that's, uh, whoop, come on, that's reported in this 2014 Sigma paper of Amongst others, Peter. Okay, he didn't compare MonetDB at that time. Of course, MonetDB would have done worse. But if you would like to calculate, please calculate the factor between a four core machine and an eight core machine to understand roughly where we are. 
I would say, with all respect, these are three different systems with three different uh, collections of technologies. But uh, Monet is not doing too badly. It's not at all. Okay, so now you challenge me to do some, some experimentation and tell a little bit about MonetDB um, internal workings. Well, unfortunately, I have to apologize that, of course, uh, um, uh, the majority knows the details. And for those which are new, I will just give you some hints and some lessons why things were actually being done the way it is. So I took this little Query 6. That's an easy one. Yeah, It's a very easy one. It has Fury scans and some arithmetic in there and some aggregation. So this is really one of the, 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 the trivial examples in, uh, in PPC gauge. You all have seen it, hopefully. Now, what's going on here? If we actually apply this to MonoDB, then we can run experiments. Here I do it as scale factor 6, uh, 10 and 100. I report what actually uh, end client would give us. It makes a nice split between what is the SQL parsing cost, the optimized cost of model, and actually execution time. So you can get these kind of numbers out of it. Well, there are, of course, some interesting simple observations. Remember, in a good system, actually, the parsing and the optimization typically is a very small percentage of the total cost. Yeah. So yes, you can improve your, your optimizer, but will it pay off? No, not in the optimized cost itself. May pay off in the execution time. Another thing you will notice when you look a little bit further, that size matters, unfortunately, after all. Because if you go from scale factor 10, scale factor 100, not necessarily actually uh, the, you have linear actually degradation in the size for all kinds of reasons. Cache sizes, all kinds of other stuff. Hmm. There are here a few numbers per one. It's actually this also gives a different performance if you're running into parallel execution, if you throw one or more threads at it. The top one at least, I see at least a factor three, two out coming out after I deployed about four threads. But in the scale factor 100, it's not achievable. No. Again, tons of opportunity. Now, so how are we going to address this issue? Now, let's Did go. You have a question? Yes, so. Just for your understanding, the different <laughs> members you show are just consecutive numbers, mem members of consecutive runs. These are independent runs. <coughs> and only independent did, runs. They are independently measured, yeah. The same server? server. Yeah. Same server, the same server, instance. same machine, same optimized uh, actually. Okay. No, the same server instance. instance. Same server. No, uh, oh. In this case, they are the same server instance. So it's the hot, hot, hot situations. So they are yeah. consecutive. Yeah, they are consecutive in the same session. If that's the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, well, they are consecutive whether you run it, measure, run, 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 or whether the machine does lots of work in between, whether there have been two weeks between two runs, or whether they are consecutive runs, one after the other. One after the other per experiment. Okay. Yeah, but the point is here not the numbers at all, it's just the global distribution. Yeah, no, 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 but you, 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 you share like But wait on, wait on, you, 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 get, you, you get your time to, 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 to give more details on how to do experimentation. No, 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 I mean, I, 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 no, I don't, that was not my point, I just asked a simple question. Good. Okay, so, um, well, one So take the SQL query, actually throw it uh, to, uh, to the optimizer, you get actually a logical plan. Now, it looks a little bit uh, funny, but in essence, this is nothing more than a tree representation of the plan. This is produced by Niels, and so Niels can explain all the little, little details in this plan if needed. Looks, little, looks simple, uh, a dozen statements, that's about it. It's tree representation. And tree representation actually, which is the result of an internal reshuffling and reshaping of the tree until you find some kind of a heuristically good plan. Niels can explain all the tricks he played there to reach it. In SQL, there's not that much shuffling going on. In this one, no. <laughs> uh, so it's a tree structure. This is also the typical structure you have, we have seen for the last 40 years in actually building database engines. You end up with an operator tree. And then somehow the operator tree has to be turned into a physical plan and then executed. 
Now, the problem with actually these trees is that if you go from a logical plan to a physical plan, you have to add a lot of contextual information. You may hide the contextual information inside an operator. You might hide the contextual information in a global variable set in around it. But this is not all you really need to execute this plan. And that's where actually uh, the motivation for Mild came in. Um, it has a number of ingredients. First of all, MOL was designed in the 19, well, 2000, around 2000, based on my history then from 20 years in compiler technology. Because uh, Eddie Tannenbaum was uh, one of my, uh, my tutors and they built the Amsterdam compiler kit. You have been working with him? No. No, I just debugged it. You debugged it, yes. Yeah. Um, the Amsterdam compiler kit, and that was an, uh, a virtual machine designed to be a simple assembly kind of language as a target for compilers. So that was way before actually the JVM virtual machine came about. And it's in that context that I decided, yeah, also for databases, you need some kind of a virtual machine to abstract away what's coming out of compilers and what can be easily interpreted afterwards. The second part is that um, if you have a machine kind of language, then perhaps you can apply compiler technologies to all kinds of optimizations. Well, if you don't have a machine like that, <coughs> then you end up actually with a tree-based structure where perhaps you had all kinds of properties. And I've seen many examples in the past where people were doing that. And then you have to drag them along through the tree, play around with it. Well, actually you're mixing a number of issues. You're mixing logical optimization, resource management, and execution control. That's what it was done in the 80s and 90s. And I decided actually to get it out. Last but not least, actually, already for my first system, I always made sure that there is somewhere in the, in the system, there's a textual interface. A textual interface where it becomes easy to actually analyze little experiments, monitor and, and, and debug, without the hassle of going into a GDB kind of setting, then understanding a big complex tree with all kinds of pointers. I would never try to debug actually uh, Niels's uh, SQL intermediate structure because it would be a real pain. Agree? No. <laughs> <laughs> he knows the way. So, so in designing an architecture it's good to understand that there are different components and somehow actually make proper hooks so that it becomes easy to, to, to analyze. Now so this uh, simple query, this logical plan, is turned into a mall plan. And this is half of the plan of that uh, query six. Uh, and I've colored here it a, a, a little bit. Uh, each instruction, each line is one more instruction, one simple assembly kind of instruction. But the yellow parts are those which are directly related to the logical plan, doing a relational operator. What's not colored, that's all circumstantial information you have to take care of. One way or another. Okay. For example, you see there a number of SQL blind operators, which says, okay, I want access to a certain column somewhere. Okay. You can hide it in an operator, but then it's a black box. By making it explicit, I can later actually associate it with a SQL blind, a completely different implementation to get, it, to get the columns from somewhere. The red parts, or the orange parts, are, have all to do with the storage management. So how you access and where you access the various pieces to, to, to execute the plan. The gray part is something uh, which is also important. That's all things which relate to concurrency effects. Never assume that your system runs alone. The query runs alone on your system. There are concurrent users which interfere with your query. Again, you can hide it. This gray part has all to do with determining the proper version against which the query should be run. You play, if I'm correct, the more Postgres approach by hiding version information 
in the underlying store and chasing the underlying store for proper version if needed. True, yeah. Yeah? Mm -hmm. That's the same as Postgres does. That's in the early days I've kicked out for the very simple reason that every Postgres record has at least 64 bytes overhead. And yes, it could place long chains. And it requires factory. That's in Postgres. That's, That's in Postgres. Well, but just, just <laughs> I put it a little bit in perspective. So it's what that scene, which I didn't like at all, and get it out. Now, of course, getting the, the right version is tricky. Uh, up till recently, we actually collected all the objects, all the tuples which were still valid. But recently, actually, short and Bills turned it around by only actually getting a list of negatives. And that actually makes things much better. But anyway, we continue. So this is this half of the plan. The other half of the plan is this one. Uh, again, there you see some results of these calculations, which are now being explicit, calculating the, the interval timings. You don't have to make it explicit. You can nicely hit in your optimizer a constant expression evaluator, of course. But again, then it becomes black box behind the operator. There are here two red lines. This is the actual code produced for Creative 6 at the current MonadoB system. And there are here two projections in, which are marked dead code. Uh, in a later phase, they will be thrown out. But it reflects something which we made a very conscious decision in, 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 the, in the optimizer. If you take a SQL query tree and you're going to play around with two duplicated parts of trees, uh, sometimes you actually would like to produce code because you cannot look ahead too far or you have to retract back into your plan to make it all consistent. We decided, in principle, dump code. Don't look too far ahead if not necessary. It may lead to code which in the end will not be used. And one of the post processors will immediately determine that actually these two projection operators have a result which is not consumed by anything, so they can be moved out. So that was a conscious decision to pollute your plan initially with things which you didn't know. That was also an, an, um, a result of an old anecdote in, uh, I was recalling the uh, EM uh, compiler kit of Andy Tannenbaum. Um, um, I made a bet with him on day before Christmas, uh, G, that's a uh, compiler kit was, which was designed for procedural languages. And I said, well, I can build you a basic um, front end on top of it in a, in a week time. And I did. on. On New Year's Eve, I sent him an, an, a postcard uh, produced by a basic interpreter on his compiler kit. But the interesting lesson, basic of course, is not procedural. And one of the things I in injected there is just generate garbage on the fly if needed. And only at the end of a stack frame when you come back, then remove all the garbage. Think about uh, at your kitchen at home, if you take a cup, it's dirty, you put it on the, on the sink. Take the next cup, put it on the sink, you know, and only once in a while, throw out the uh, clean it up. So don't be afraid to to immediately clean each cup, but collect actually dirty stuff to a later stage. So small lesson in this respect: um, a little bit rough material is fine. So this is the the. This is nothing more than a um, direct representation of the logical plan in the following sense that it represents the data flow of all the little tasks which has to be taken and executed to get to the final result. So an execution plan is a data flow graph. Now that gives immediately the opportunity that how are we going to resolve a data flow graph? Well, in this case, this are a lot. Each line de determines a dependency in the sense that one operator needs multiple inputs from others, and it cannot actually be executed unless that's available. Uh, so yes, you probably start here with one worker, uh, but at this level, I may have perhaps even multiple workers being active. So the number of parallelism depends on the breadth of the graph. In some areas, like here, when this task is being done. 
Well, I can immediately go to this one, this one, and this uh, until here. So this doesn't require any actually queuing uh, activity because the same thread can take <coughs> action until it's blocked, and then that work can go on. So it's all about actually creating these kind of graphs. And this is a simple graph to play. So solving a query is an abstract way solving a data flow graph. Now, how do we come here? Well, this is the example of the, the, the data flow graph after a number of steps. And what you see here is a fully expanded data flow graph. Every little task is turned into a line in this, this, uh, this, this plan. How do we reach that? A whole lot of optimizers. All of them. Taking a mold plan, doing a little activity, and then giving to the next one. For example, here. This is a simple optimizer. It looks for constant expressions, evaluate them, and put them back in place. Yeah. Um, another one. Well, here's an optimizer called Data Flow. It goes to the whole plan and determines actually all the sections which are side effects free, and in principle can then be handled by a Data Flow scheduler. It's only that task. There are many more here, and I'm not going to, to go through all of them. I only wanted to focus today on this one because this actually triggered me to do a little bit of experimentation. Um, yeah, well, and that has to do with how are we going to prepare a plan for parallel execution? Now, lesson one of database plan execution. So here we have the operator tree. This is the way in the old days, when I started out, things were being, uh, being executed. You have the operator tree, you have one actually worker. It will just call P, recursively call pieces actually from the underlying operators. So these were all actually coding based execution. Very simple, very straightforward. 1978. Uh, next step, in the early 80s, we decided to call, okay, we have to do some distributed processing here. So we associate with each operator, in principle, a worker. So now we have independent three threads being actually working together. But as soon as we do that, there is a need to plug in somewhere a communication channel. One way or another, it started out by just a single buffer for a single record. It grew out into a buffer of multiple records, fully materializing to me the results. And it all the way grew actually to, to the factor-wise structure where we had only very small factors. Yeah. The point here, takeaway is here, whenever you're going into a parallel processing, you have a communication issue to solve, which implicitly requires a communication channel and the buffers. Or you can take the hyperpose and glue them some together so you don't need it, that's fine. That's also a buffer. Okay, um, warnings. And we hit our, our nose also in MonoDB in early states. Queries never run alone. So yes, in the first uh, data flow interpreter, we had a fixed number of uh, worker threads. And it was very easy for, for, uh, for a concurrent, uh, for a query user to just hijack the whole machine. Up to the point that we could not allow any new client to actually connect because every, all resources were taken. So that's a problem. So you have to be aware that queries <coughs> are competing for resources. The second part, of course, is that all operators are non-uniform. That's just a, a, a fact of life. That's absolutely not new. That has been known for four decades. Um, and the way, the, the general way to do it is if you run into the session of a non-uniform distribution, split the problem into smaller pieces and assi assign them individually. Yeah? So that has been known for the, since the 80s. And recast into Morsel processing in 2014 because some people like to see real names. But the technique is really old. So in MonoDB, 
This is the, the expanded plan to uh, generate parallel processing. So all these little tasks were in the null plan, and that leads to this rather complex graph. So we have split here one table into pieces. We have duplicated part of the expressions where needed. And now we have a big graph. So if I have now two worker threads to attach to it, well, they can start, let's say, doing this one. When well, actually they're both done, then at least this one is enabled. This worker thread can continue here. This one actually will start here, working on, it may continue. And actually at some point they will come together. So the individual worker threads actually work their way through the graph based on actually the availability of, of intermediates. Um, so now, how do we come to this graph? And that's where the mitosis uh, optimizer steps in. So this is literally the summary of the code that you can find in the query optimizer. So we have a plan. So what we first do, we go linearly through the plan, find the first table, the first, we find the largest table in that plan being referenced. Hey, that was looking for SQL bytes. It was all explicit. It's there. And within actually the plan, take the first column, only the first column. Don't look what's going on, just take the first column. So now we have identified one column, which is within the largest table. Second one, look around how many active users are there, because they are my competitors. Determine how much memory we have. And then we are going to split up the memory into chunks, small pieces. So we partition the memory by defining it with the number of active users. So every active user gets a portion of the memory, and within one user, a worker thread, is not allowed to, in principle, allow more than that uh, piece. So then we have decided actually the memory fragment. We have here already the largest column. So now we can determine how many rows of the target column will fit into that piece of memory. This gives us a mechanism to split the original table into pieces. Now, then we of course have to partition the database, the, the table into pieces. Now, in MongoDB, that's a zero cost operation. Very nice. Well, then other optimizers step into the play, into the game, and uh, make sure that uh, uh, the plan is unrolled. And in the default case, the number of workers actually is set to the number of TDK uh, number of threads uh, to play around. Oops. So, what was now the experiment you challenged me? So, at least last week, you, <laughs> I was working on an, uh, uh, on a small change that in the customers we have, they have BV machines, 100 cores. And you don't want to have a single query actually to hijack everything. You probably want to chop up the resources. So, I added two features to Monet. One feature is that per user, I can say you may not use more than, let's say, eight cores of T96. So that's in uh, one decision. The second thing I added was that uh, per user we could limit the amount of memory they are allowed to play in. Now, that last one I twi uh, twisted around and I used that to make a slightly change to this algorithm. I actually took that scheme to split the largest table into fixed size portions, hardwired portions, running from a megabyte to 256 megabytes. Now, so that means that one of these columns was actually popped morselized into pieces, and then actually the whole plan was being executed. And uh, from this simple change, I made uh, the large experiment. So the same machine, simple, uh, the same simple machine. Optimized build in the current default for production, only looking at hot results, looking at uh, the three standard scale factors, changing the sizes of what is the Paul Morse size, 
uh, and variate the number of worker threads. Now I made a change here to the SQL uh, scope factor as 100. I didn't go all the way down to one megabyte portion because plans are being unrolled. So you can imagine that the execution plan become large. Even if I go to scale factor one and I let's say a one megabyte, you end up with a model plan which is about three million lines of code. Yeah. Good stress testing of the optimizer. Yeah. Now, so now what are the results we got? Well, there we got the, the Stephen Manigal effect. So you end up with a plethora of, of results. So I have about 28,000 uh, experiments being run and now trying to digest it. So what I'm now going to present is the first digestion and probably it needs at least a week to further dive in into the details. But these were the results um, obtained so far. So let's go. Query one, scale factor 10. So change the block size. Uh, changing the number of workers is a pattern what you expect. And the pattern what you expect is that uh, if you take smaller block sizes here, you get a better performance than the large, probably the caching effects and all that kind of stuff. You see that as I throw in more worker threads, things are getting faster, but up to a certain point where the additional gain is marginal. So this is more or less what I reflected. The dotted lines here are the, the execution time of the, the heuristic um, process approach, just as a frame of reference. So, not too bad. We miss some obvious good improvements, but it's not too bad overall. Another one. Martin, what's the y axis? Millis uh, this is my, uh, milliseconds. But still, you would hope here at the linear scale. I know, you will get more, hold on, you get more pictures. And I, I, and I have 40, I have four more pictures. Good. So, and if, if, if you really want, I will throw actually the whole results at you for analysis. <laughs> so, uh, scale factor 10, query 6. Well, that's a known behavior. But the weird behavior is, well, it's, it's, it's a good behavior. That's what you expect, nothing spectacular. Uh, but block size doesn't uh, have a big impact. So let's okay. look at a slightly sorry. different, Can sorry. Why is it so slow when you go to like the really small block size in case it's... Yeah, that's a good question. It seems like it's factor eight. That's a good question. Mm. I will repeat that, uh, that same question in a minute from now. Because I looked a uh, slightly different picture. So here I have all the experiments uh, organized by worker threads. So how many worker threads are actively uh, doing the work? And here in color guarded actually the size of the, of the buffer size. Uh, with all respect, I'm not 100% sure that I didn't make a mistake in the, in the, in the graphical layouts, just to go. but just this is mid-flight result, yeah? Mm -hmm. But what was in the red line was the average over all actually the size of being considered. So yes, Peter, indeed you expect that it nicely actually gets, gets better and there are at some point um, uh, things going on where overhead or all kinds of intermediates become many to play, but I will show you that at, at final. But the orange ones, these were the measurement times for the heuristic. Mm -hmm. Not too bad, I would say. At least that was pleased that it was not uh, too far out. This was, <coughs> okay, the black points was the smallest block size, one megabyte, roughly like that. This was for the big ones, 256. Now, first, first interesting point is, Hmm, the spread is way too far for my, for, my, for my pleasure. So the block size choice had a reasonable sizable impact. So that was a point of further study later on. Hopefully somebody will do that after me. Okay. So 
I think th these two shows seem uh, not the same as in the slide, sorry, uh, that you showed originally, because there I was kind of figuring, so what was the best block size, and it seemed to be <coughs> a bit in the middle, actually, the best block size. It's, it's, it's in the, indeed, so there is, there is, yes, Peter, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Not the smallest one. No. Yeah. Well, um, so here's this, this one, if you look here, one, if, one. Uh, I, I can show you later on, I will show you the, the, the full graph, you can see the details of the experiment. But there's at least a point where you start thinking, hey, mm -hmm. this is coming out of the uh, out of the experiments, what's going on here? Uh, but query 1 was the smallest one, right? Query this is called query 1, yeah, yeah. Exactly, so. and here's query 1 on scale factor 100, here things are going to appear which I can't understand at all. Yeah? Well, leave it for the moment, uh, except by, I'm not so pleased with the spread of these sizes. Um, things got a little bit worse when I compared query 1 and query 6 because the colors are reversed. Hey, that's what I didn't expect. So in query 1, small actually chunks were very good, but in the other one, small chunks were the worst you could pick. No clue why. Yeah? So that's a starting point for good research. Why is the morse of this kind of chopping actually has so effective? and why things seem to change with query by query? So yeah. I might actually have an answer for this. Good. <laughs> because I then you can write a proper paper. Uh, so the reason that this is so different is because of course query 6 has a much higher uh, selectivity, which means that a lot of tuples get filtered out. And because the parallelization and such happens at compile time, it's not taken into account. So what happens is a lot of things get filtered out and threads have like very imbalanced words. This is just a, um, yeah, could probably. Because I, I realized this before when I was uh, running the Python UDFs. And if you have like a filter that filters, say, the first 75% of the table, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you split it four, okay. it still means one thread does all work. But now, the, of course, the underlying question is, now if you're going after a morsel structure, mm -hmm. when and how are you going to decide on the size? Okay. That's, that's, that's the question behind it, so, yeah? In fact, if you have like very small pieces, so you get many more tasks in that workers, uh, to actually balance the that's, skew, you have much better. True. Yes, yes. So, um, <laughs> that's good true. idea. Oh, yeah. uh, so, the other thing that of course different, uh, and in particular, possibly, and I have to ask what's the current state, because I'm not that familiar with the user technology anymore, uh, with all the new things. Um, so, these queries are next to the fact that this is a simple, well, what the queries share is a single table query, they join three queries. Uh, what uh, they differ is if so activity, the one gives you almost all the data, query one, the other one has an entire table of it, and uh, query one is a group by and it will sit in the global aggregation. Um, what does Monelli do in terms of parallelization on group by queries nowadays? There were times where um, we did not parallelize it because we group by both, both of these are parallel. Yeah. Both are parallel. Yeah. So they're, they're, they're One partial group. aggregation and full aggregation. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Two steps. Two steps. Okay. So uh, the, and, and uh, query one is nice in that case because you have to keep small number of groups, so it doesn't harm that there is a regrouping going on after the isoparallel, right? So it's a group by uh, in each thread, in each uh, each uh, part of the plan. And right. then they're concatenated and grouped by and aggregated again. Yeah. Okay. So which works nicely with the, with the small number of aggregates before. Uh, so, yeah. okay. so that is not the potential reason, but I just wanted to include that. Okay, I only showed you here a, a few of the graphs. I will, I'll show you the, the overview uh, as well, but let's let's keep it simple for the, this this moment. Let's not uh, go too further deep. I was pleased at least looking at the pictures that the version doesn't work too bad at all at least it avoided me to find the model size. Optimizer overhead remains small, as long as I wouldn't cut it in more than 128 pieces. Beyond that point, the, the, the plan explosion actually showed me some, uh, some corner cases where optimizer really needed some adjustments, which I'll show in a minute. And yeah, so this is an open area for those who want to go after 
that kind of way. So lessons learned so far. Uh, what I hope to show you that the way actually the, the execution time appears was taking a top-down approach. So I didn't start out with cash lines in the old days. I said, this is my resources. How am I going to chop the resources into pieces? Who gets the pieces? Uh, make things explicit wherever possible. So take white box kind of uh, um, uh, execution plans because that gives you a handle to later on do analysis and refinements. And they're not hidden inside your operator implementations. Uh, Peter missed the first slide, but better is you should do neglected comparisons with MonadaB uh, too often. Uh, I will show you later the, the slide number one. Sparing him something. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, I, never, I, I have never. So the, that could only backfire to you that you were actually afraid. That, you were afraid that it would backfire to you as one of the original designers on MoneyDB. That you look better and worst. Well, well. Anyway, we know that, that's not the point. It, it's, uh, I will show you. So, so thanks or not thanks to your structure and doing these little experiments um, I of course hit that corner where the optimized reads that were becoming into the play which then immediately led you to an, uh, a cold current experiment to see where the heck I was uh, time being spent and then one evening actually I uh, changed some of the optimizers to make it uh, better and what was the underlying cause and it's also a repeatable issue all these examples were based on running through a small list, which initially you would not have never dream about it. It's a small list which you have to go through. But if you scale up, that's going to backfire you. Uh, in terms of um, if you have an, uh, an 800,000 mall program and your hash function is not correct, and you're changing a collision list, which is way too long, it's out of the question. The same is going on here in merge table. I'm not finished yet, but that actually can be removed uh, as well. So every of these kinds of experiments gives you a collateral insight how to improve and do it. So I think this was more or less. Uh, let me. Can I get some more stuff out of this? Uh, yeah. So. Just, just to give you one little part of all the queries. So by the time you're going to think that you have the solution for query six or query 10, then you can't find all the shapes of all the queries. <coughs> These have different patterns to play with. Now, Pedro, was this what you expected? Yeah, this is a perfect matter for a TTT, yes. Good. That's it. So, if anyone has um, any questions to Martin, uh, uh, Stefan, please. <laughs> Just for my understanding, you started out on one of your first slides saying that the impact of optimizing the cost is not visible. Your last statement says happy to make this a further improvement and to show how you can improve the optimizers. <laughs> I know. Um, I'm I spending learned, my time in the wrong I, I, direction. I, 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 I once was. Uh, you, 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 Am I correcting that? That what, what's my statement correct? That your first uh, uh, that your first slide said optimizing cost on a yeah, mask, and your last tag is about optimizing uh, improving your. You you dropped one by uh, one sentence. I said there are outliers, and the outlier was that's what triggered me. If I have a scale factor ten uh, with a one a one megabyte block, the plan exploded to eight hundred thousand. And then actually the optimizer cost was three times the execution task cost. Okay. Yeah? As I said, it was just for my understanding. Yeah, Thanks. so but that, but that's a good point because that actually shows you that actually I wouldn't have gone after this experiment to, to optimize an optimizer. No, this was an outlier which I stumbled upon. And then it took me one evening to, to, to nail it down what's going on here and improve it. Yeah. And that's the good part of these kind of uh, consuming uh, thousands and thousands of experiments being run in the Stefan Malengold method. It shows you things which you A, not fully understand yet, and it gives collaterals where you can improve in areas you didn't expect. That's it.
I, I, I feel honored that my name is mentioned so often, but <laughs> <laughs> I have to point out that I've been largely outnumbered by Howard Lyon, so. I've been largely outnumbered by Harald Lang. It's a number of experience. Okay, good. <laughs> so, Peter mentioned that he had many people to mention yesterday. Was Peter McCray as well? So that was uh, that question. Any other question? Now. Then uh, let's uh, keep it up. Then Peter uh, can still collect his uh, little box of chocolate. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you were. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you, you were too. meeting. Sorry about that. I missed the first uh, slide. No, the first slide is here. <laughs> okay, well, I see it. Um, uh. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, I'm glad you managed to understand uh, <laughs> one of, uh, three, one of six, uh, the different, uh, the, the impact of the block size of the long back and the life of the more about it. Uh, I'll wait for, uh, for Mark to, to go after that one. To do it. <laughs> 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 more. We saw here next Thursday at 1 p.m. And that's when the Christmas meeting will be afterwards. Yeah. 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 So I guess we'll have a TTT next Thursday? I mean, I guess it's also fine just to postpone it for after the New Year's. Uh, uh, Everybody is here, we'll just like uh, short in your life. Very, uh, okay, cool. Christmas. Or just a, a spontaneous.